the area known as Sumer Babylon, what we now call Iraq. And they settled in a place called Khazaria. Khazaria was an empire in the Caucasus. Um, and on one side was the Christian Empire, on one side was the Muslim Empire. And the king of Khazaria, called King Bulan, in 740 AD, had a mass conversion of the population to Judaism. In fact, the king of Khazaria was called the Kagan, and that's why Kagan is such a uh, common Jewish name today. And people talk about certain Jewish genetic traits. They talk about the, the, the Jewish nose and things like that. And we all different races have different traits. Well, that's actually not a trait of Israel. It's a trait of the Caucasus, because that's where it all came out of. And as the Khazaria Empire broke up, they moved up into northern Europe, or north into Europe, into Russia, Lithuania, Poland, and all these countries. And then eventually moved across into Germany. And these were the people known um, as Ashkenazi Jews that um, suffered under the Nazis and founded the State of Israel and many moved to America. There was no and there is no historic connection of today's Jewish people to the land of Israel. It is a giant hoax and as Arthur Kessler says in the 13th tribe of this situation, it would mean that their ancestors came not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race, that's where we get Caucasian from. And that genetically, Kussler says, they are more closely connected to the Hun, Uyghur and Magar tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Should this turn out to be the case, and it is, then the term anti-Semitism would be void of any meaning based on a misapprehension uh, shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. And that's another thing, anti-Semitism. Semitism, Semitic, refers not to a race, but to a language group. And that language group does not include the Khazars. And in fact, the vast majority of the Semitic uh, language group is from today's Arab countries and Arab peoples. See what I mean? Everything is inverted. And this story has such massive importance to understanding what is happening today, how we got to this state, and so much more about what's going on in the world. And that is what I'm going to explain and go into uh, today. We'll start off by looking at the fact that there is a plan uh, I've talked in these video casts and at length in my books um, about numbers of examples of confirmation that what is happening in the world now is not happening in a random fashion. I mean, if, if you look at my books over the years, I mean, I, I'm watching my books unfold now on the television news in, in, in news stories being delivered um, all the time. And that's not because I sat in a darkened room, um, you know, going into the ether, but because if you can access um, this projected plan 
then unless something comes along to intervene and stop it, then you can predict the future with pretty good confidence in terms of a theme and in many cases even a lot of detail. Um, one of these examples uh, came in uh, 1969. This is just one, many I could give. And it was a guy called Dr. Richard Day. Dr. Richard Day was a national executive uh, chief of Planned Parenthood, a Rockefeller organization, uh, which came out of the eugenics movement. And uh, he was a Rockefeller insider. And as a result of that, he would have um, access to this projected plan, this projected agenda. And for whatever reason, in 1969, he addressed a group of pediatricians in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and asked them to turn off recording equipment, not to take notes, because he was going to tell them how the world was going to change. Now, these are just a few of the things he said, because one uh, doctor there, one pediatrician, uh, did take notes and uh, kept a copy of them. And before he died in, uh, I think it was about 2004, um, he did a series of taped interviews describing what Day had said um, all that time ago in 1969, actually on March the 20th, when he addressed the Pittsburgh uh, Pediatric Society. Now, these are just a few of the things he said were going to happen because it was all um, preordained. It was all um, in the pipeline and nothing could stop it. Well, we can stop it if we, A, find out it's going on and B, get our asses in gear and do something about it. Anyway, these are some of the things he said. Technology used for reproduction without sex, 1969. Families to diminish in importance. You look at any of these projected um, versions of the agenda and you'll see destroying the family unit as in virtually all of them. Euthanasia and the demise pill. Limiting access to affordable medical care makes eliminating the elderly easier. There are many, many ways now that um, the, um, the elderly are being eliminated, not least by doctors saying you're going to die so we, you know, why don't we just let you die rather than do anything uh, for you when people who have had that said to them and not gone on these pathways to death by having drugs and, and food and what have you withdrawn. They've lived for a long, long time afterwards. Um, they weren't dying at all. Um, this is very interesting given, well, many examples, um, SARS, swine flu, and all these uh, health scares. And now, of course, uh, the, the big one, center stage is Ebola. Uh, Dr. Richard Day said there would be new, difficult to diagnose and untreatable diseases. And there's a reason for that, because they're coming out of military laboratories. I'll get into that uh, later on. Suppressing cancer cures as a means of population control. He was saying that uh, Rockefeller institutions in 1969 knew the cure for cancer, but people are going to die of something, he said. So why not cancer? As long as it's not me, you know what I mean? Um, Restructuring education as a tool of indoctrination. That's not been done, is it? My goodness me. More time in schools, but pupils wouldn't learn anything. Have you noticed that, um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a guy in, in the education establishment in this country, we call it Ofsted, um, who's saying that children should start to go to school at two. What? But wherever you look, that's the case. What he said in 1969, more time at school, learning less. Because they don't want educated people, intelligent people. They want workers, obedient workers, as George uh, Carlin uh, put it. Um, controlling who has access to information. Uh, schools as the hub of the community. Have you noticed how more and more um, parents are losing uh, a say over what happens to their children It's being given to the school? Um, changing laws to promote moral and social chaos. Out of chaos, you can bring your order, your new order. And then you have more chaos and you bring some more order and that way you transform society. Um, the encouragement of drug abuse to create uh, a jungle atmosphere in cities and towns, get them frightened, that justifies more law enforcement uh, uh, of more and more extreme uh, kinds. Promote alcohol abuse, restrictions on travel, 
Um, the need for more jails, no more psychological or physical security. It's going to be a theme of the video, ca video cast this week. No more psychological security, especially because of something called future shock, which I'm going to go into. Uh, crime used to manage society. That's clearly happening. Curtailment of US industrial preeminence happening, massively happened. Shifting populations and economies, tearing out the social roots, taking away any sense of stability or unity or, or, um, or order. Sex and violence inculcated through entertainment. What's her name? Miley Cyrus and all that stuff. Look at it. Um, implanted ID cards, microchips. I've been talking about that for like, 20, 20 years or more. The, the microchip agenda and the transhumanist agenda. What are we seeing now? More and more um, proposals to microchip um, everything, microchip people. Food control. <sighs> control if people eat or not, unless they do what you, do, you say they do, you, you got them. Same with water. Weather control. This is uh, happening uh, all the time now. Manipulation of weather, extremes of weather. Oh, it's climate change. No, no, you're manipulating it, mate. All right. This guy, Richard Day, was actually uh, uh, worked in weather manipulation during the Second World War. Uh, knowing, people how, uh, knowing how people respond, making them do what you want. That's classic mass mind control, which is what Future Shock is part of. Um, falsified scientific research. Global warming, I rest my case. Um, use of terrorism, 1969. Look at it. Surveillance, implants, and televisions that watch you. Smart TVs. Uh, this is this is all those telly screens, of course. And the arrival of the totalitarian global system. Now, the normal course of events, cause comes before effect. You have the cause, then you have the effect. But what happens with this conspiracy is that they decide their effect first. This is what we want to happen. And then they have to say, well, how do we create a cause that has that effect? And that's what mind manipulation and social engineering is all about. And it is, um, um, there's a massive network of organizations that around the world that are dedicated just to manipulating public opinion. And what is that? Mass mind control. Many years ago, I was uh, covering an air show in Britain for a television station. And they had, uh, at one point, a mock display of bombing. Obviously, um, they were fake bombs and the noise they made and the impact they had was a tiny, tiny fraction of the real thing. But what I remember when I was close to it, when we were filming, is the extraordinary noise that even that kind of device can make and the impact it has upon you the shock of it, even when you know it's just a display. So, to comprehend what the people of Gaza have been going through, and the kids of Gaza have been going through, with these weeks of bombing with state-of-the-art weapons, is is impossible. It's impossible to imagine the horror and the fear that they're going through. And of course, with all the casualties of their friends and family being killed and maimed for life. And what I want to talk about today is the mentality that allows that not just to happen, but makes it happen, that orders it to happen, that gets off on actually 
doing it. And I've said many times, but it's worth emphasizing again. One of the biggest problems that humanity has in general, not everyone of course, in comprehending what's actually happening in the world is the lack of understanding of the depth of pure undiluted evil which is driving this world in the direction that it's going and has been doing so for a long long time throughout no human history basically and when you don't appreciate that there is a a depth of evil that defies the imagination that is playing out an agenda before our eyes what happens is people write off or explain to themselves coldly calculated interconnected happenings of pure evil as just random coincidence well it's not a random coincidence it's not a random coincidence in the, in, in, in the terms that it's happening because it's coordinated it's going along a path Gaza is connected to Libya is connected to Iraq is connected to Ukraine and so on but it's also connected in terms of the mentality behind it and there is a, a it's not even rare it's it's shockingly common the character trait behind these things which is widely known as the psychopath the psychopath and the sociopath and the narcissist are different some milder, uh, some uh, more extreme, but they're different expressions of the same basic mentality. And to understand Gaza and to understand what's happening in the world in general, we need to understand the nature of the psychopath, the sociopath and the narcissist. And uh, in uh, the Perception Deception, I uh, give definitions for uh, these states of being, shall we say. A uh, psychopath is defined as a person afflicted with a personality disorder, characterized by a tendency to commit antisocial and sometimes violent acts and a failure to feel guilt for such acts. And when you see the horrific pictures coming out of Gaza of the consequences for civilians of the bombing. And then you see the Israeli reaction from classic psychopaths like Benjamin Netanyahu that have no sense of guilt. Far from that, it's a, a, an effort and an exercise in blaming others for your psychopathic behavior. A sociopath is defined as a person whose behavior is anti sense of moral responsibility or social conscience. There's a word uh, that will link all this in a second. An obvious self-focus in interpersonal exchanges. And some of the other uh, definitions that kind of pull psychopath, narcissist, and sociopath together. A lack of psychological awareness. Uh, here's the word. Difficulty with empathy. I'll come to that in a sec. Hypersensitivity to any insults or imagined insults. I mean, you you criticize uh, Israel and they, they're off on one. They, you can't criticize Israel. Um, otherwise, uh, the abuse comes the other way, no matter what they do. Um, vulnerability to shame rather than guilt because the uh, these personality types especially the psychopath have no sense of guilt 
um, as I've just mentioned. Um, uh, detesting those who do not admire them. Again, coming back to criticizing Israel. How dare you? Um, using other people without considering the cost of doing so. Inability to view the world from the perspective of other people. Denial of remorse or gratitude. Now, the word is empathy. All these personality types, um, they do not have the ability to empathize with those that suffer the consequences of their actions. And this inability to put yourself in their place and imagine and feel what they must feel in terms of the consequences of your actions. That is fundamental because from that lack of empathy comes no limits. Continuing just blatantly, pathetically predictable series of events that involve what's happening in the Middle East and Ebola. The, the term that's often used um, is mission creep and mission creep is what I call the totalitarian tiptoe. You start at A and you're going to Z and you go in steps uh, but you don't tell them where you're going to start with you just tell them about the next step you want and so when David Cameron um, and um, Barack Obama particularly David Cameron in this country, said there will be no new war quite a few weeks ago now. Well, it was laughable because I've been writing about this manufactured, engineered conflict in the Middle East for, well, decades that this was, this was coming and this was designed to um, create a much bigger conflict pulling in more and more countries as a result of it that's what we're seeing with as usual the united states and britain um, at the forefront so it was obvious there was going to be a war and so eventually they said well we, we can't we can't have these isis people doing what they're doing so we've got to have airstrikes and first of all it was American airstrikes first of all to um, help some people that were trapped on a mountain according to the the, 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 the story that was put out they're trapped on a mountain so uh, to help them out airstrikes against ISIS that was step one um, or first step of, of violence if you like um, directly um, and then it was clear that you were gonna have um, the next stage, which was we need more airstrikes because look what they're doing now. And isn't it funny how these, these ISIS people, um, they inherit all this state-of-the-art kind of weaponry and, and high-tech weaponry from the fleeing Iraqi um, army that were given that technology by the United States. And, and they know how to use it. Why? Because they've been trained, not least in Jordan, by the United States. To create the problem, to create the enemy, yet again, this age-old technique, create the enemy so that you can justify uh, some action you want to take. So um, that was the next thing. We need uh, more airstrikes ongoing in um, Iraq. Then, of course, the next thing is, well, actually, their base is in Syria, isn't it? So... We're going to have to have airstrikes in Syria. Whatever Assad says doesn't matter. We're the land of the free. We're going to do it. Now, um, we've reached a point then where uh, the United States was uh, bombing in Syria, having lost with Britain, Cameron, a year earlier, um, support or failed to get support to bomb in Syria against Assad. So they're almost there. And the, the next one now, um, oh no, the next one after that was Britain, of course. Uh, yeah, this is another thing which I put on social media at the time. 
Well, Cameron's saying, um, we won't rule out airstrikes. Well, I'm going to rule out airstrike. It's on your bloody script, man. And again, it was just the totalitarian tiptoe. And so eventually, um, because of the way that the propaganda has been sold to people and bought in very large numbers and bought by the vast majority of Westminster politicians and Capitol Hill politicians, um, Britain uh, got the vote, overwhelming vote, to start bombing uh, ISIS targets in Iraq. But Cameron didn't try to get permission to go into Syria because of what happened to the year before when he was, um, he was voted down. So um, the next thing that we're going to um, be seeing, in fact, we are seeing it already, is the, well, there'll be two things. One, we can't, um, this is Britain, we can't contribute um, most effectively to stopping ISIS without us also bombing in Syria. Um, and what's uh, appearing now as a result of um, what is happening in the border town, the Syrian border town with, um, with Turkey, is they're starting to float this idea that actually you, you, you can't stop ISIS with airstrikes alone. Of course, the military people have been saying that on cue um, for weeks. But now the politicians, well, you see, I mean, I know we said, like, we were only going to do airstrikes, but, you know, I mean, it ain't working, is it? So we, you know, we can't just let it go, can we? Can we have a few more, you know, videos of, of violence against people so that we can we can get them even more frightened can we can we organize that because then they'll say well we'll, we'll have our boots on the ground then hey right yeah okay i'll leave that to you yeah okay and so we have this um mission creep totalitarian tiptoe going on before our eyes so blatantly i mean the contempt that is being shown for um the public all over the world with these lies and um, falsehoods about here and no further, when they know they're going way, way further from the start. But the ability to lie um, is, uh, with no shame, is, of course, the ability of the psychopath. Um, and so, appropriately, they can lie, these people, without shame. Um, and... So here we are now, uh, where they're starting to push on with, we'll need boots on the ground after all. And in terms of Britain, oh, we, we, we'll, we'll, we'll need to bomb in Syria as well. And that's the other thing that, that, that will be coming. Uh, we can't stop ISIS in their headquarters in Syria unless we remove Assad. Infamous people like Henry Kissinger, Jacob Rothschild uh, and others. And... The email was about the fact that he wants to um, launch uh, a training program for uh, people who want to do something similar to him or want to get into the reporting side of alternative information. And uh, it's, it's a great idea. And I found um, very clearly from the time that I was working full time with the People's Voice um, just how vital it is to train people who um, have the skills uh, to communicate and have the skills to um, hold these people to account by knowing how you get close to them, uh, knowing how the system works, and basically being uh, a journalist with uh, an alternative uh, view and knowledge of the world. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, myths and uh, misunderstandings about my uh, connection to the people's voice. Uh, people, I, I guess I understand it, my name's been associated with it, that, that, that I run it um, and I've, I've run it since the start. I haven't. I don't. Um, I could never, on top of everything else, take that level of commitment on. What I did was, um, first of all, have the idea to, um, to create it. I um, helped to raise the money to make it happen. And of course, it's now been broadcasting uh, 24 hours a day, um, suppressed information. 
since November last year, which is an extraordinary achievement from an idea that was only about this time last year. Uh, my commitment was to volunteer to work with the station full time from about September through to uh, the end of February um, and get the content together. Uh, that was my role, getting content together, getting presenters um, who could, you know, front the programs. And, uh, you know, when you, you've got a blank sheet of paper and 24 hours of data fill, that, that's quite a challenge, but it, it, it happened. And the reason I mention all this is that it was in that uh, period with that experience of uh, putting the, the, the initial content together that it just hit me just what a, a massive hole there is to fill in terms of expanding the communication of this information through the alternative media um, in terms of people who have a some understanding of the world beyond the mainstream be it some understanding or a lot of understanding and um, and, and on the other side have the uh, television skills and the communication skills to effectively communicate that information. There seems to be uh, more with that dual capability um, in America, but then again, there's a lot more people in America. And certainly in Britain, uh, from my experience, um, we, we, we need a, a lot more people who um, can both uh, see the world and see another angle on world events and be able to communicate it effectively in television terms. So I'm absolutely um, with Luke on what he's um, trying to achieve. And if you, if you, if you Google uh, um, him or go to We Are Change New York, I'm sure you'll find the details of what, what he's um, seeking to do. Very, very important. But what I wanna do today is go to another level of this, which is to get the information circulating. Yes, we need people who um, ha have a knowledge of it and have the skills to communicate it in the way I've been describing. But there's a, another great block on the circulation of this knowledge and the communication of it from people who've become aware. And that is the emotional side of it, like, um, dealing with the abuse and the ridicule when you start giving a different version of world events, different version of life and reality. And this is not just, um, you know, for the people like me who stand up and speak out and get all the abuse and ridicule. I'm, I'm also talking about people who um, feel intimidated about talking to their family and their workmates and the, the people down the pub or the bar about um, their view of everything and the, their different view of the world and what's going on. So in this week's uh, video cast, I mean, I've been on this road 25 years and I've, I've, to say the least, taken just a little bit of abuse and ridicule. And so what I want to do in this video cast is just pass on um, a bit of uh, the experience that, that I've had in, in how to deal with the intimidation that so many people feel. Um, when it comes to speaking out in a world that, um, or in an environment that doesn't want to hear. The truth always turns out to be some shade of grey, not black and white. But what we've got overwhelmingly from the Israeli propaganda supported by the West is a black and white view, good guys v bad guys. And it's it's not a John Wayne bloody movie, and it's certainly not black and white. And it's about time people had the guts not to um, quiver in fear that they're going to be called anti-Semitic and actually stood up for speaking the truth. Because this is not about attacking Jewish people. It's about looking at the behaviour of the Israeli regime throughout the period since 1948, at home and abroad. And this information should be available to everyone, not 
pushed away. Ooh, they'll say I'm anti -Semitic. I couldn't care less. I care about the truth. And I care about what's happening to oppressed people, whoever they are, whether they're Jewish or whatever. And this, this group of former soldiers um, involved in breaking the silence and many other Jewish people, both in Israel and around the world, who speak out against the many horrors inflicted upon the Palestinians by this Israeli regime, this Rothschild Israeli regime, are fantastic people, uh, very, very brave people who get enormous uh, abuse and threats often as a result. And we need more people like that to put the truth in context instead of in propagandized bias. So let's have a look at what he said in this interview um, on RT. His name is Aaron Hefrati. Uh, a former IDF uh, soldier, like I say, who recounted his experience, assignments and killing protocols, along with what he witnessed as a soldier. And he first of all explains that there, it dawned upon him the similarities between what his grandmother experienced in Auschwitz and why he was compelled to um, speak out against Israel and the IDF because he could see the similarities in how they acted compared with what his grandmother um, experienced in Nazi Germany. That's a staggering statement for a former um, Israeli soldier to speak, but this is not his only experience or the experience is not confined to him. But there are many others who are speaking out in the same way. In Britain, people like uh, Gilad Asmon and many others in this Breaking the Silence um, organization. And um, Iran says that he, he comes from a family of army officers in Jerusalem, really into the military system. And he says that he was told when he was growing up that the only way he could stop the Second Holocaust from happening would be to join the best unit in the army he could and fight the enemy of the Jewish people. Of course, the draft is, is uh, compulsory in Israel, and many very brave and committed Jewish young people go to jail to defy the draft because they will not um, do what they're asked to do in relation to the Palestinian people. Anyway, his family um, were su survivors from Nazi Germany and he joined the Israeli Defense Forces and then he said he saw the truth. The truth, he said, was that he wasn't there to protect Jewish people from the enemy, but to put terror on the people in Palestine. He found himself, he said, not protecting Israel, but in the occupied territories protecting illegal settlements and settlers. Quote, I am there to police every minute of their lives. I am there to take their lives and control it, to go into their houses in the middle of the night to arrest them. Children, adults, young women, young men take their lives sometimes, responding to protest, any resistance, with very harsh violence with rubber bullets which of course are not rubber he says but real bullets just covered with a little bit of rubber or a tear gas canister or sometimes live ammunition live ammunition that will sometimes take the lives of the kids this is the reality of what's happening in Israel behind the bullshit and the propaganda that you see through the mainstream media he said he was told to make sure that a dead child's family did not get out of their home to the funeral during an imposed curfew. Quote, and when the father is coming out to understand what is going on, we arrest him and the mother of the child that our unit killed the night before. The mother is screaming at us. Her screaming was exactly like the screaming of my grandma, he says, when I was growing up and she was dreaming of Auschwitz. The reason that this is so powerful 
is not only the source that it comes from, but the fact that it's true. This is what is happening behind the smokescreen, the propaganda and the lies. Quote, I understood that this time I am not the victim anymore. This time I am the colonial force in the territories. This time, if I want to continue the legacy of my grandpa against the colonial forces, I don't need to be in the IDF. I need to fight against the IDF and Israel in the occupied territories. And he goes on uh, to talk about IDF policy in relation to killing Palestinians. He said, IDF policy of bombing one neighborhood to utter destruction um, is designed to show them they cannot resist. And he says that this is what happened in Gaza in that uh, slaughter in 2014. On one occasion, he says, with full IDF official backing of bombing a single area with 120 one ton bombs from the air, plus tanks, plus snipers. And he said that when people came back the next day to see the devastation um, and they were screaming the names of family members that they'd lost, they were shot by sniper fire from Israeli troops. Now, the reason we don't hear this nearly as much as we should is because of censorship. Um, he was saying how nothing that anyone says exposing um, what is going on can be uh, communicated freely. Um, he says that um, those exposing the horrors and the lies through their organization, like breaking the silence, um, can be reported, uh, can't be reported in the Israeli media unless it first goes through an Israeli army censor. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the country described as the only democracy in the Middle East. One of the hazards, you might call it, of what I do, and anyone who puts out information which is outside of mainstream belief systems, is you get, well, in my case anyway, a tidal wave of abuse and ridicule. In fact, the ridicule at times uh, has been of almost historic proportions. But if you're interested in what's really happening in the world and you care about exposing things so they can be stopped, then you just have to take it and live with it. But if what you say has any validity, then eventually it will be shown to be so while you're alive or when you've gone, history is full of such situations. And so it was when I came out a few years ago and said that Jimmy Savile, the BBC entertainer, use the word loosely, was a paedophile who liked to have sex with dead bodies. Now, I understand on first hearing at that time that people would go, you're mad. I told you he was mad. At now we're seeing the scale of what Jimmy Savile did in terms of his paedophilia of, well, almost unprecedented, certainly that, that we know about, unprecedented scales of uh, paedophilia over decades, decades. But also it's come out this week, confirmed in a official report into his activities in terms of abuse uh, within uh, British hospitals, that he did indeed like to have sex with dead bodies. In fact, he uh, volunteered famously uh, as a porter at a hospital in Leeds and the reason he volunteered was not out of the goodness of his heart it gave him access to the mortuary and what people have got to start understanding if they want to 
understand the world they're living in and what's directing their daily lives is that this this world is controlled by a scale and depth of evil which is almost beyond comprehension and Jimmy Savile is one of those people that give you access to see openly the scale of evil that I've been talking about all these years. Jimmy Savile was not just a paedophile. He was a procurer of children for the rich and famous. He was, of course, an inner circle uh, bosom buddy of the British royal family. And in all these um, investigations and reports that have come out and are ongoing about his extraordinary activities, there's been no mention of his connection to the royal family, his connection to Prince Charles, the fact that he was so close to the royal family that he was used as a a go-between, a mediator between Prince Charles and Princess Diana when their marriage was falling apart. He was also an extremely close friend of the longtime Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And I tell you from, from my research, um, there was a serious paedophile uh, nest in Margaret Thatcher's government. And let's not forget that Margaret Thatcher's um, closest aide and Svengali was Lord Alistair McAlpine, who sued uh, or threatened to sue anyone who even began to indicate that he was involved in paedophile activity. And he never once threatened to sue me when I had named him as such in a book in 1998 and repeated it on my website at the time that the great furore was going on. Pedophilia is a vast industry and the establishment is up to its neck in it, which is why They'll hang Savile out to dry, now he's gone. But they won't go down the roads that lead to exposing those famous, massively famous people who are involved in both the abuse of children, yes, the sacrifice of children, some of them, and running the rings that supply the kids. And there's another thing which I'm going to talk about today. The source for what I said about Jimmy Savile, who's proved to be so unbelievably accurate, told me other things. Equally fantastic, in fact even more fantastic. And I'll tell you something, they're true as well. Well, I'm going to start with a definition, sum the whole bloody thing up, really. Um, the definition to the word farce, a light dramatic work in which highly improbable plot situations, exaggerated characters and often slapstick elements are used for humorous effect. Well, apart from the, the humorous effect, because I can't find anything funny in paedophilia, not least political paedophilia, but that definition of farce sums up what is happening in Britain this week. And it's not just about Britain, for those uh, watching from around the world. What I'm going to describe and the kind of things I'm going to describe are happening in every country, not least in the United States and North America, as are, are documented in my books. Now, the farce comes because of this, and it, it's part of an elephant in the living room. There is the most enormous evidence. I mean, 
extraordinarily so, that there was a massive paedophile ring during the Thatcher government in the 1980s that went right into the heart of a government and involved the infamous paedophile and procurer of children, uh, Jimmy Savile. And this paedophile ring, in its various expressions, has gone on ever since, as it went on long before. But at this point in the Thatcher administration now, evidence is coming out to, to pick it up at that point, although it's, it's ongoing, like I say, right to the present day. Now, what happened uh, in 1983 is that a man called Leon Britton was Home Secretary in the Thatcher government, and a Conservative Member of Parliament called Geoffrey Dickens, who was a campaigner against paedophilia and political paedophilia. And he took a dossier, apparently some 40 pages, to Leon Britton, and asked him to investigate. It named names, it named very famous names, and it named, its, uh, it seems very clearly, it named uh, Jimmy Savile. This is 1983. And nothing happened about it. And it went missing. And there was no ongoing response to it. So um, another MP uh, now, who has... Um, written a book exposing a major British political figure, now dead, called Cyril Smith, as a, uh, another kind of um, a paedophile uh, of uh, an addictive type. It was the centre of his life. And I met Cyril Smith once on a BBC uh, radio uh, programme called Any Questions. And uh, I have to say, and not with hindsight either, he was one of the most vile people I've ever met in my life. But anyway, as a result of this um, MP now um, pushing this on, he's asked Leon Britton, who's still alive, though no longer in uh, politics, where did the dossier go and what happened to it? Now, Leon Britton's first response was, I don't know, mate, I don't know what you're talking about, when he was, he's been asked about this before. Um, I, I don't recall, I don't recall, you know, this lost memory. Uh, technique but then he completely changed around said oh yeah I do remember it and and yeah I, I passed it on to these people and uh, they asked them to do something with it and, and so what's happened to it now well it seems that the dossier has been lost and destroyed and it just so happens to name major names um, in politics uh, and uh, others uh, as uh, paedophiles uh, connected into this uh, ring and, you know, I met um, a lady called Andrea Davison in North Wales in the late 1990s when I was putting together a book called The Biggest Secret, which is exposing all this stuff. And um, she was connected to the intelligence uh, agencies in Britain. And she was vehemently uh, campaigning against paedophilia, political paedophilia. In fact, she, she was uh, a, an advocate for some of the victims uh, who gave evidence at the uh, inquiry into the North Wales uh, paedophile ring and abuse at North Wales um, children's homes, which also involved politicians. I'll get to that as we go along. And because of Andrea Davison's um, commitment, uh, Geoffrey Dickens actually gave Andrea part of this dossier, which has gone missing. And um, what happened to it? Well, what happened to Andrea first? She was uh, fitted up uh, in a, a court case, uh, which um, would have led to her being jailed unless she got out of the country and is now um, on the run, in effect, in, um, in South America. Uh, and in, was it 2010, a combination of North Wales police and Derbyshire police, they raided her home and took away all the evidence that um, she had, including, sits back in amazement, the uh, parts of the Geoffrey Dickens dossier, which he gave to her, and of course the dossier itself has gone uh, missing. Did I say there was an elephant in the living room here? I think I may have mentioned it. Um, and uh, Andrea said of um, Geoffrey Dickens, 
He was a man of strong views and high principles. I didn't know him well, but we had a common interest in exposing corruption, particularly police corruption, and child abuse. Many of my documents and evidence were stolen by the police. I am reliably informed that they were worried in 2009 that because Jimmy Savile, the VIP, uh, that, that Jimmy Savile, the VIP paedophile ring, would be exposed. Now, Jeffrey Dickens' son, uh, Barry Dickens, has said this week uh, about his father and the dossier. After my father outlined the paedophile, uh, outed rather, the paedophile diplomat Sir Peter Heyman in the Chamber of uh, Commons in 1981, an insidious campaign was started against him in the Houses of Parliament. You do surprise me. Den of iniquity and paedophilia, by the way. Certain dishonourable members began to hound him at every turn. They would ridicule him, seeking to make him a figure of fun. In that way, I suppose, they hoped to trivialise the dossier on uh, his dossier on child abusers stalking the corridors of power. Now we know my father was right, he said this week. He was right about Cyril Smith. He was right about Jimmy Savile, who I believe were both named in the dossier. Therefore, it was long before this, mind, I'll come to that, but... In 1983, Jimmy Savile, who everyone's now going, oh God, and we never knew, um, was known about in 1983. So was um, Cyril Smith, this, this, this vile man. Um, and I'm, I'm not surprised that he was a friend of Jimmy Savile. I know that um, quite a few people who've spoken publicly or gone on the internet and supported uh, the vote to keep Scotland in the United Kingdom. I've been subject to uh, quite enormous abuse from elements of those who are determined to see Scotland withdraw from the Union. Well, a couple of things to that. First of all, um, you're talking to someone who um, is a world expert on taking abuse. I've been taking it for decades, um, uh, ongoing. <laughs> year after year after year, so it's that abuse is not a problem for me. But secondly, I actually agree with those that want Scotland to be an independent country. But what I'm saying is, I'd like Scotland to be a truly independent country. And that is not, I suggest, what is being proposed here. I have uh, always been a great advocate and supporter of devolving power to people in their own communities. Because it seems to me, and, and the evidence of history is overwhelming, that the further away from people that decisions are made, the less relevant uh, to those people those decisions are. When you've got people who've never seen a community, never seen a um, an area of a country, um, sometimes even a country, that they're making decisions about. I mean, that is just extraordinarily stupid. Um, but of course, there's a ulterior motive for setting up a structure like that. So I'd like Scotland to be truly independent. I'd like Wales to be truly independent. I'd like the states of the United States to be truly independent. I'd like communities to have uh, an independence that can decide what happens in those communities. It's called freedom. And it's the opposite of what the global cabal, the global network that directs human society and manipulates human society. It's the opposite of what they want. And if it's the opposite of what they want, well, I'm always going to support it. Because when there's a few and they want to control the many, which is the situation that we have, then they have to centralise decision-making to give them the power to do that. Because the more points of decision-making there are, the more devolved um, decision-making is and power is, the less um, ability any central cabal has to dictate globally, even nationally, if you do it right, because there's just too many points of decision-making, they can't keep a handle on all of them. 
So anything that devolves power truly and gives true independence, I'm absolutely with. But I would suggest that that's not what is being proposed with Scottish alleged independence, which I'm going to come to in this video cast. And what I'm talking about is not just about Scotland, it's about the world. Because what I'm going to say about Scotland, and I'll, I'll give it a global dimension as well, not least the United States, what is happening with regard to Scotland, and what is being said with regard to Scotland, actually is applicable to everywhere. Because, you know, there are no independent nations anymore, much as some people may love to believe in that in the run-up to this vote. Centralization of power is fundamental, like I say, to the few controlling the many. And if you look at the way it's evolved, because as I've, I've explained in detail in the books, this is not some manipulation that started yesterday afternoon or 50 years ago. This has been going on for centuries and centuries and beyond. Um, and what we've seen is the constant centralization of power in all area of our lives, all areas of our lives. So if you look uh, at one point, we had a tribal situation where people in the tribes all around the world uh, made decisions about things affecting the tribe. There were vast numbers of points of decision making. We then had this pivotal period when loads and loads of tribes were brought together under what was called nations. And now the few at the center of the nation or in the positions of power in the nation were now dictating to all the former tribes in that uh, land area. And what we've seen, of course, through, um, through the 20th century and to now, is the next stage of that, which is bringing nations together so that a few at the centre of the grouping of nations, I mean, the European Union, the region where I'm sitting now, is a classic example of that. In fact, the forerunner example of that. Uh, so bureaucrats are now at the centre of this European Union and they're planned like that all over the world and they're evolving to that before our eyes. They're now dictating to all the former nations and therefore all the former tribes, if you like, that we had before. And so this incessant centralisation of power has given more and more power to the tiny few as we've moved on into what actually was given a name in the end, globalization. What is globalization? It's the centralization of power in all areas of our lives. And the plan is to go to the next stage, we're already seeing people talking about it, go to the next stage where you have a world government dictating to the, to the planet via these various unions and via, um, I was going to say national governments, but the idea is not to have national government in the end, but to have just regional government to remove the, um, any unity of response and challenge to the edifice of power above. Now, it's in that knowledge and it's in that situation that we're facing that this call for an independent Scotland and the claims that if it withdrew from the European Union or, or not the European Union, from the United Kingdom, it would be um, somehow independent. Well, that, frankly, is fantasy. I'm not saying don't do it, but... Let's do it in the knowledge that an independent Scotland 
in complete control of its own affairs is a fantasy. And it's a fantasy because of the structure of control that's been put in place over decades and decades and decades. And today I'm going to go into detail about that and also um, give it the global um, perspective. It's not just, like I say, about Scotland. Local story that became a global story in the last few days. Uh, Portsmouth is where a family called the Kings live with a five-year-old son called Asher who has been suffering from a brain tumour. And Southampton is where the hospital is, Southampton General Hospital, where the boy Asher has been uh, treated. Now, it's a story that encapsulates the mentality of the state and what we've allowed the state to become. I, um, I've heard many horror stories from people on the Isle of Wight who've been treated for cancer um, and other things come to that uh, at Southampton General Hospital. And so it didn't surprise me at all that Asher's family decided that they had to try something else because they were not satisfied with what was going on at the Southampton Hospital in, involving the treatment of their son. So what they did is they took him out of hospital and they headed for mainland Europe and ended up in Spain because they wanted him to be treated with a, um, a more targeted um, radiation treatment, still radiation, but a more targeted called um, uh, proton therapy. And what that does is target specific uh, cancer cells rather than just giving the whole body, and in Asher's case, the whole brain, the, uh, a, a smack of um, potentially lethal radiation. What happened um, when they decided to do what they felt was best for Asher was absolutely extraordinary. With the full might of the state coming down on them, in terms of the medical profession, the police, judges, um, councils. I'll get into all these different elements as we go along in this video cast today. But what it brings forth in this story is that it's not only individuals that can be psychopaths. States can be psychopaths. Um, you know, anything that can be done and manifest through an individual can be manifested through a group. So you can have an individual who's of a certain character and you can have a group of people together who are of the same character. The collective and the individual are different expressions of the same thing, whatever that character and personality trait is. And um, I've talked in um, video cast before about the fact that the world is basically controlled in terms of positions of power by psychopathic personalities. And when you then look at um, this story of um, Asher King and his family, you see the psychopathic collective nature of the state in terms of the way it operates. Um, here's um, a few definitions of a psychopath. So uh, see if this relates to the state as you experience it. Psychopaths have no conscience. They have no empathy, no ability to put themselves in the feelings that they are making other people experience by their actions. They have no emotion, in, again, links into conscience and empathy. They have no remorse, no remorse um, for their actions. Um, Tony Blair, I rest my case. Um, but there's one um, addition to that, is that they can show fake remorse if it's necessary to get them out of a problem that they're in. Um, psychopaths manipulate people. State doesn't do that, does it? Um, 
it, they're perceived as being sticky, slimy, and slippery. <laughs> David Cameron, Barack Obama, I rest another case. They're control freaks. They are serial bullies. They have an exaggerated sense of self-importance. They're fantasists. Uh, they consistently apportion blame to others when things go wrong, regardless of how uh, logically an explanation was given. They're looking for whipping boys and four guys to um, take the blame for their actions. They twist and distort facts to their advantage. They have an inability to accept responsibility or blame for their actions. Uh, did I say Tony Blair? I think I did. Uh, they can be vicious if cornered. They spin a web of deceit. Uh, they have a hidden agenda. They have a selected memory. They remember your mistakes but forget their own. They take credit for other people's work. They try to make you feel guilty, the, the guilt trip, um, if you protest about um, doing what, uh, in this case, I, the state wants you to do. Um, they're happy to dish out criticism or abuse, but they're not happy to receive criticism or abuse. It's do as I uh, say, not do as I do. Uh, they give you a sense of being talked at rather than being talked to. Um, they can't be trusted. They break promises and breach matters intended to be in confidence. They stab you in the back. Um, they fake sincerity with great conviction. Uh, they're not team players. They act autocratically. They're two-faced. They lack any kind of personal depth. Uh, I don't mention David Cameron. I think I may have mentioned him as well. Um, they get others to do their dirty work. They're looking for attack dogs and hatchet men. They change the rules frequently, but deny the inconsistency. Many use expressions such as, I was only following orders to justify their actions. They see things in black and white. Something is either all good or all evil. See uh, government statements of propaganda about almost anything. Uh, they lecture you endlessly until you agree. And they think that normal rules of society don't apply to them. They are somehow exempt they're not concerned with right or wrong for their own actions, only with whether they can get away with uh, doing something without being caught. See, the great, the great um, crime of government is not doing something appalling. It's being caught for doing something appalling. That's the big crime. And um, while doing that, the psychopath insists that others adhere to strict rules of their making. Now... If I've ever heard the state, in all its forms around the world, um, described perfectly, well, that's getting close. And it's the descriptions of the behaviour of psychopaths. I, I've had um, a number, more than a number, of um, psychopaths come into my life um, over the last 25 years since I started this journey to disrupt and to undermine, um, some at close range, some a um, bit farther out. And so that experience has given me um, a considerable understanding of the psychopathic mind and how it works and how it manipulates, which has been of enormous value in understanding how the state operates and manipulates. Because if we're going to see through the lies and the deceit and see through the propaganda of government pronouncements and policies, then we need to understand how they think, because they think in a certain way. It's the way of the psychopath. And thus, um, lying is absolutely not only not a problem, it is a fundamental foundation of the psychopath. The meeting of the Bilderberg Group. It's the 63rd meeting this weekend, and it's in Austria. Now, thanks to the alternative media, lots more people have heard about the Bilderberg Group than ever before. It's still a fraction compared with the global population, but for a long time, hardly anybody had ever heard of it. And that was just what the Bilderberg Group wanted, because what it is, it's a, a forum and a gathering of people from different areas of the system and different countries, uh, finance, politics, corporations, intelligence, media, and so on. And the idea is to 
coordinate the same agenda, the same policies among all these apparently unconnected people so that the same agenda unfolds everywhere. And to bring in uh, to these conferences people that may be in a particular subject area at a particular time, they need these people to act in a certain way. And the idea of bringing them into Bilderberg is to use that opportunity to, shall we say, persuade them that the Bilderberg policy in this particular area or that is the one that they should pursue. And they've been, when you do the deep research, they've been extraordinarily successful in pushing their policies on the world. The Bilderberg Group was at the heart of the creation of the European Union and the introduction of the single European currency, the euro. It's been behind globalization, um, which is what? The incessant centralization of power in the world, which is what the Bilderberg uh, organization is all about in its many and various forms, centralizing power in all areas of our lives. And it's be, be, uh, been behind um, economic crashes and many and various things that have actually um, directed the world in a certain uh, direction of policy that the Bilderberg and its uh, insider shadow controllers um, want to see in the world. And so when you um, think that for decades and decades and decades, the Bilderberg Group and its connected operations, which virtually no one knew about, has been making decisions and causing the introduction of changes in the world that have fundamentally affected the lives of those people who had no idea it existed. And even now, compared with the population as a whole still, tragically few have heard of the Bilderberg Group and never mind what it actually does. And Bilderberg is not an entity in and of itself. It's part of a web. It's part of a web immediately uh, connecting to organizations um, in its, if you feel like it's, it's its own little web, but that web is part of the greater global web. Uh, which I'm going to uh, talk about and um, describe today, along with uh, the topics for discussion at this year's Bilderberg, and particularly the one that should be centre stage in people's mind, artificial intelligence or AI, machines taking over human society. And that's not some sci-fi it will come sometime over the rainbow. It's actually unfolding around us now, every day, drip by drip by drip. So I'll come to that in the connection to this year's Bilderberg Conference um, as this um, video cast proceeds. But some history, first of all. In the latter part of the 19th century, a secret society was created called the Round Table. It was created by the Rothschilds, basically. And its first head was a Rothschild gopher known as Cecil Rhodes, who plundered Southern Africa and the gold and diamond reserves on behalf of the Rothschilds. What happened then is this Round Table started spawning satellite groups. In 1920, it created the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London. 1921, the Council on Foreign Relations in the United States, which still today is fundamental in um, directing and manipulating United States foreign policy. In 1954 came the Bilderberg Group, and in 1968 came the Club of Rome, which has been the vehicle for using the environment and global warming as the excuse for more and more centralization of power and more and more erosion of freedoms and the transformation 
uh, of human society in its uh, endless forms that come out of we must save the planet. I'm all for that. I'm all for um, respecting the environment. I'm all for not destroying the environment. But that's not what this is about. It's about using the environment to create a problem to which they can offer the solution, which is introducing their agenda of global control and transformation of human society, not least industrially. And these same people were behind the creation in 1945 of the United Nations. Because the United Nations is what? It's a vehicle for the global centralization of power. It's a stalking horse. The United Nations is not uh, as it is in terms of it's meant to stay like it is. It's like it is as a stepping stone to fully fledged world government, world dictatorship. There's some of these guys that people these organizations. Um, another one I should mention is the Trilateral Commission that was brought in in the early 1970s by David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's former national security advisor, both fundamentally involved in this whole agenda that I'm talking about. And so we have gone about our lives and gone to work, brought up our families, looked at the news and seen how the world is changing because this decision has been made by the government or this decision has been made by that government or this organization or this war has broken out or that oil price hike has happened or um, this economic collapse has happened. And all the time, behind the scenes, in the shadows, away from public attention, these organizations that work as one unit, including the Bilderberg Group, have actually been creating and directing those changes. And while this has been going on, people in the media, the mainstream media, have A, ignored the existence of the Bilderberg Group until at least some of them couldn't anymore because of the alternative media more recently. And B, when they have spoken about the Bilderberg Group, it's been in terms of these lunatic conspiracy theorists uh, and what they say about it. But let's just um, look at this from a deep breath, take a step back, look at it again, point of view. The Bilderberg Group is a meeting once a year, and of course there's a steering committee that meets all the time, but it's a meeting once a year of people in politics, the people have actually elected, in the media, it's supposed to be impartial, it says here, um, and tell people what's going on in the world and find out what's going on in the world from the system that doesn't want people to know. It's supposed to be a journalist's job, I thought. Um, and yet, these politicians, corporate people, bankers, government officials, journalists, have been gathering together year after year to discuss where the world is going and where it should go. And the people who have been subjected to those changes, often in a very negative way, not only have had no say in what was decided, they've not even known what was decided and who by because it's been done in secret. Oh, them conspiracy theorists! No, you know, you know, you know the the the, the, the most um, out out there theorists in the world, coincidence theorists, who think that all these connections and all these things that happen in coordination are some uh, somehow happening by chance, by random accident. What a nonsense it is! I first came across the uh, Bilderberg Group back in the early 1990s. And the first one I got close to was in 1995, a place called Bergenstock in Switzerland. I was staying with some friends about two hours, three hours drive away in uh, Switzerland, 
way down near the Italian border. When I got a communication, like a round robin communication from the American journalist Jim Tucker saying that he'd established where the Bilderberg meeting was this year and it was that these hotels, one was called the Palace, another one called the Grand, this place called Bergenstock. So just before it started, I went out there. And um, I got up to the hotels and the, you had the people in the shade. You know, when you, you see these kind of films with, uh, you know, the the feds in the shades and, and, and all that stuff and the suits. And and you think, oh, maybe, maybe that's a bit far-fetched. It's not. It's what they look like. It's what they act like. Anyway, they were all there. All the preparations were going on. Um, and I got up to the hotels. It was a few days before. And then um, on one of the days that the conference was actually going on, I went again. This time, I couldn't even get onto the mountain. As soon as you turned off the main road, onto the uh, the road that went up the mountain to these hotels where this Bilderberg meeting was going on, there were the Swiss police with roadblocks. You couldn't go any further. And I chatted to this Swiss policeman at the roadblock in his big, luminous orange jacket. And I asked him what was going on. And he was a nice bloke, but he didn't know. He just knew that there was um, a meeting of important people going on up there. And he had to stop anyone getting up there on this road and through this roadblock. And that's how it works. Compartmentalization. People are only allowed to know within the system what they need to know to do what they need to do. And so you can go very high in the system in in all the different areas before you find anybody that actually is in awareness of what the hell it's all about and what's going on. I've spent much of the day watching the alleged debate in the Houses of Parliament, the House of Commons specifically, where members of Parliament in this country have voted by a massive margin, 524 to 43, to allow airstrikes by uh, the British military in Iraq against uh, ISIS, ISIL, Islamic State, whatever it's called tomorrow. And so the United Kingdom is back in Iraq. Why they ever move out, I don't know, because they might as well stay there because you know they're going back. And what we're looking at now, as I've been saying would come for so many years, is Orwell's perpetual war. We have the British Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, uh, today, saying in the debate that these airstrikes uh, against this Islamic State will go on for years. Well, that's just the start of it. What he has said in this uh, motion before the, Houses, uh, the House of Commons today is that it's just for airstrikes against uh, Islamic State in Iraq. But anyone with a brain knows that this is just the next stage of a long, long process that has led us to this perpetual war. Um, if you have a war uh, against uh, a specific enemy in a specific kind of country, then there comes a time when that war is over because someone's won. But when you have this war against terror and terrorism in its multiple forms, how do you ever know? when terrorism has ended. You, 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 you can't say that because you don't know what's coming tomorrow, at least in the, the theoretical uh, way that this war on terror has been uh, sold to the public. And so you've got the perpetual war that Orwell talked about, a perpetual war to, to constantly um, acquire more land, more resources, and to justify a fierce uh, police state at home to protect the public, this was all said in this debate again today, yawn, 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 
to protect the public from the terrorists um, on, on home soil. And if you uh, go and see the photograph library on my Facebook page or read my books or, or look, look at previous video casts, you'll see that for a long, long time since this whole thing started, I've been saying, look, this is a process leading to an all-out war in the Middle East.